Well, good morning, church. Come on now, let me hear you. Good morning, church. Amen, man. Go ahead and grab your Bibles and go to Acts 17. We're going to be in Acts 17, and we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 2. So however you want to access the Word of God today, whether you got a physical Bible, which um, that's awesome, or you're pulling it up on a device or whatever, you're going to access God's Word so that you can shovel through and join with me as we wade through the waters of Scripture in just a minute. Um, how are we doing? Everybody Good. It's summertime. It's awesome. I know it's going to be scattered. We're grateful for technology and our team that helps take vintage wherever you might be as you're traveling throughout the summer. Just continue to remind you, online is awesome. It is an awesome supplement. It's a terrible substitute. It's an awesome supplement when we're away and when we're traveling and we're all those kind of things. It is not a substitute, as we talked about last week, for being present among the body. But leverage that technology. Stay connected with us as we move out through the summer. Um, I, I want to ask you a favor, if I could, if you'd willing to indulge me. Um, to, starting today, over the next couple weeks, we're going to have a little over 50 middle schoolers and high schoolers spread across two weeks of camp out at Victory Mountain. Can we just celebrate that? That's awesome. Over 50... 50 students. It's an awesome space where God's going to work. Um, and so uh, today, this afternoon, our middle schoolers head out there for a week. And then next Sunday, our high schoolers, um, I'm going to be out there with our high school boys um, for the week. So pray for me as teenage feet will be the scent of the week. Um, <laughs> is what it is, bro. <laughs> uh, so just be praying that God would move in a mighty way. Um, and I know how easy it is to get con- uh, we're all guilty of saying we're going to pray for something or somebody and then you forget till you see them next. Um, so do whatever you need to do. Maybe go into your phone and set a daily alarm at a certain time and just, just as a reminder to pray for our middle school students this week, our high school students next week. It's just an opportunity for them to get away from the craziness of life and summer and that kind of stuff. And, and, and God, I believe, is going to do amazing things and pray for, we've got several adult leaders that are going to be pouring into the lives of these students, grateful for people that are willing to take vacation weeks to go and just invest in students. It's just, it's just awesome. So pray, pray, pray for our kids as they're out there. Um, last week, you saw these awesome new shirts. They're available in the store out front. All the proceeds of these shirts are helping to fund scholarships for kids for camp um, because I'm sending two to camp. I took out a second mortgage. Um, it's crazy. Uh, so just make sure that you're praying for those students. Uh, during the first gathering, uh, I was standing over here and, and looking, and this almost this entire front row was middle and high schoolers and just leading the way in worship, all with their hands raised, all just praising God with freedom and joy like some of y'all adults need to learn. I close my eyes, so I'm not looking at anybody when I say that, but just that freedom to worship. And I'm reminded that like this is vintage. This is vintage. We're in this theory called, called This Is Vintage, but looking at them and knowing that there is a generation of, of young people that gets it, that has grown up in this church and finding not just loyalty to an organization, but commitment to their savior in a way that permeates every bit of who they are. And, and that's what, they are not leaders for the next generation. They're leaders now. Y'all need more coffee. They're leaders now, like right now. There are middle schoolers and high schoolers back there helping along with other adults to serve and, and teach our kids about Jesus. And, and even today, uh, I'm about to make you cry. Even today, looking up and seeing Ashton like running the soundboard, this young man who grew up in our church and now stepping out there using this gift. And everywhere, you can hardly look into any space and not see somebody younger that's leading the way. And that's... That's what, that's vintage. That's vintage. The, like the church is supposed to be this, this mixture of young, old, new in their faith, seasoned in their faith, coming alongside together. That the church can so quickly get imbalanced. Uh, of, if, if you don't have new converts and new people entering the faith, then you're, you're, you're not fulfilling the commission of God. But then if you don't have people who are growing to come alongside them and disciple them and pour into them, you end up with, with people that just stay in spiritual infancy. And we need that balance of, of all people pouring into one another. That is vintage. That's, that's the culture of a church that I've always prayed for, that it wouldn't be a young church or an old church, that it would be a mixture of everybody coming together, knowing that this thing called the body of Christ is supposed to be this plethora. You like that word? 
this plethora of people and we've been in this series called This Is Vintage and we do this quite frequently because who we be matters. I know that's not good grammar. But I keep saying, who, you know, what we do flows out of who we are. And so often we get so consumed with what we're supposed to do, we forget about who we're supposed to be. But if what we do and who we be doesn't align with one another, the doing will fade. It will expire. It will be inconsistent. Come on. That we have to grow and mature in our faith. And, and so every now and then, I just, we just pause and kind of lean back in, especially to the book of Acts. Vintage means representing the high quality of a past time. That as you read the book of Acts, what you notice is this movement of God that was handed to people like us, y'all. Just ordinary people who were entrusted with this mission from Jesus to go and make disciples. And this movement is blossoming and it's thriving and it's doing all these amazing and wonderful and beautiful things. And what you discover is... The effectiveness of the early church was not dependent on a specific strategy. It wasn't even dependent on a certain set of tools. What I have submitted to you is there's a culture that's present present in the New Testament church that matters. There's a culture that they embodied, and I think they fought to protect, that kept it being the thing that Jesus intended it to be. And the problem is, Culture or a healthy culture, it doesn't just happen. It happens with intention. It takes effort. It takes energy. It has to be built, but listen to me, it also has to be protected because things tend to shift. And so over the last few weeks, we've just been looking back at their culture and learning lessons. And then last week, we moved to kind of unpacking these things that we call our core values. Because core core values, our values kind of serve as the guardrails of the culture. And so last week, we talked about the core value of intentional relationships. Because I don't know how you peer into scripture and think that God doesn't put high value on relationship. From Genesis in the beginning, this all started, creation began with a relationship. Like God created humanity in relationship with him and then sin severed that relationship and all of the Bible and all of history is God sending Jesus to restore a relationship and discipleship requires relationship and last week we were just reminded there's a lot of good content out there but no amount of content can overcome the absence of the right community. We need people, we need relationships, we need encouragement, we need prayer, we need accountability in our lives. And that was so present in the New Testament church, but it doesn't take long to look throughout scripture and especially through the book of Acts to see something else that's really important. But let me say this, before I start to dive into our next value, what you value is evidenced by what you do, not just what you say. Anybody can say, well, this is what I value. You can say, well, you know what? I value my marriage, but are you pouring into your spouse? Come on. Anybody can say, I value discipling my kids, but when's the last time you had an intentional spiritual conversation with them? Anybody can, we can say anything, and and what I hope and pray is that as we unpack these values, it's causing me to examine where we're investing, where we're putting time, energy. Follow the trail of your resources, and you will determine what you value. Follow the trail of your resources, your time, your money, your energy, your, like, follow that trail, and it'll reveal what you value, and if you follow that trail, it might reveal something other than what you say. Come on. And see, all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the book of Acts, so much of it is trying to calibrate, correct, a drifting from this culture that we see established in the New Testament. And protecting the culture and keeping the church walking in alignment with its values required brave men and women to step up and lead in a way that kept the right things the right things. That's why for for us, 
one of our core values is inspirational leadership. Because to keep a culture moving in the direction that's healthy and good, it requires good leadership. Some people know that because you've seen the opposite. You've been in a culture of poor leadership, whether it be in the church, in a business, in a school. When I say the word culture, you know what I'm talking about because you've experienced it and you experience it every single day in your regular lives. Remember, your, culture, your, your home has a culture. Your business has a culture. Your school has a culture. And the temperature of that culture is most often determined by the people who are in charge. And all throughout the New Testament, you see people leveraging their influence to keep the church moving in a healthy direction. But one of the things that I think we have to recognize that, that in the church, everybody has the responsibility of leadership. I feel the pushback already. Because see, here's the thing. When we start talking about this word leadership, and I don't believe you can, I believe we've done too much of divorcing leadership from discipleship, but in our world, in the church world, you can't disconnect those two things. But if in its essence, as you've probably heard it said before, leadership is influence, then everybody is a leader because everybody has influence over somebody. Amen. You know you're leading somebody. The question is, in what direction? Parents, you're a leader. You have influence over children, and you're shaping who they're going to be. That's scary. Good. It should be. You have influence. See, some, you're, you're a leader even if you're not in charge. There's somebody whose eyes are watching you, whose ears are listening to you, and you're shaping them, molding them in ways you may not even know. And leveraging our influence for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom is the responsibility to everyone who claims Christ. Christian Christ follower, whatever label, whatever terminology you use for the fact that you follow Jesus, you are required to be a leader. You are required to the leverage the platform of influence that God's given you, whether it's in a home, a school, a business, a community, a sports field. You have the responsibility to steward that spot for God's glory and the advancement of his kingdom. Everything you do, you should do for the glory of God. You should see every place he puts you as a platform to serve him and bring him honor. And it matters. Throughout the New Testament, you see these people using their influence to keep the church from shifting towards something that it shouldn't be. And you don't have to go very far into the book of Acts before you see a critical moment that we've talked about before. This moment where this man is healed and it's Peter and John and they're going to pray and people get all bent out of shape and some authoritative bodies begin to get a little bit freaked out because the church is growing. And there will always be a segment in the community, it's usually the religious folks when a church begins to grow. But when they're called in, what's interesting is what they're asked to do. They're not asked to, to quit being charitable. They're not asked to quit serving people and to do these good things. They're asked to stop using the name of Jesus. And in that moment, it is pivotal in the history of the church where they can either step up and lead or shrink back and compromise. And they say... Do whatever you got to do. We cannot help but speak about what we've, we have seen too much to be quiet. And it's interesting what's said about them in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's always stuck with me that this distinguishing mark from them was not their formal training. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that's not important, that pastors shouldn't go to school, that there's not importance of a preparedness. Come on. Right. 
But it says what they took note is they had been with Jesus. It hit me this week that if a pastor during the week doesn't sit and soak on the, in the word, then on Sunday he shouldn't stand and speak from a platform. Amen. If a pastor during the week doesn't sit and soak in the word, then on Sunday he shouldn't stand and speak on a platform. You got to be with Jesus. You want to leverage your influence for God's glory, you need to start spending some time with Jesus. You need to be with Jesus. You need to be with Jesus every day in the word and in prayer. But as you move, through, I'm preaching like 15 sermons a day. Y'all okay? Y'all with me? Um, as you keep going through the New Testament church, you see these pivotal moments where there's a chance for it to veer off out of fear or out of whatever. I mean, like you move into to Acts and, and you see this moment where Stephen, who was one of those appointed to help care for the widows and the orphans, but has an opportunity to preach the gospel. And he does it so boldly that some people are offended so offended, they drag him out, they stone him, and they kill him. And for the first time, you, could, you see, we could die for this. And you know what it says? It says that on the other side of the perse persecution of Stephen, the church became more bold, not less. More determined to share the gospel, not less. And the gospel begins to just spread to other places that it had not yet been and there was a person that was overseeing this persecution. When we introduced to him, his name is Saul. He was a Pharisee, and he believed that everything that Jesus started was contrary to all of his belief system. Until one day, he's walking down a road, heading to this town called Damascus, and Jesus shows up and radically changes his life. And he goes from persecutor to planter of churches. And there's some things that Paul embodied as a leader that we're going to look at in just a minute that are convicting me, and if they're going to convict me, they're going to convict you too. <laughs> See, if you move through the story, God would send Paul into these cities, and essentially what he would do is he would go in, and he would start in the synagogues, and he would open up the Old Testament, and he would start unpacking all the connections between Jesus and the prophecies, Jesus in Isaiah, Jesus in the Psalms, Jesus in Leviticus. He would begin to show people how Jesus fulfilled everything that they had been looking for in the Messiah. And if you move on into Acts chapter 16, he, he shows up at this city called Philippi, and he ends up at, a, at this place with this woman named Lydia. Lydia was... Uh, a dealer in purple cloth. She was kind of like this well-to-do fashionista kind of woman. And, and purple cloth was the most expensive cloth because it took the most effort and it was the most expensive to make. And, and Lydia, her home becomes the first location of the church at Philippi. She leverages her influence and her connections and her relationships to give Paul a space to come and preach. And a church is born. Don't underestimate the significance of that. But what I find interesting, and I love every time I talk about Philippi, I have to think about there's three specific individuals that were a part of that church that we introduced in Book of Acts. It's Lydia, this fashionista woman with all this wealth and all these societal things. And then another person that apparently becomes a part of this church is this demon-possessed girl. That was a fun potluck after church. <laughs> and basically, she's being exploited because whatever this thing in her is causing, there's men using it to make money, and they're following Paul around, and they're screaming, and, and for one, Paul looks around and says, whatever's in you needs to come out, and he speaks it out, and now these men know that this thing is gone, and their ability to exploit her and make money is gone, and so they get all mad, and they get Paul and his friends arrested, and he ends up in a jail, and a worship service breaks out right in the prison. And everything happens and the chains fall off and the doors fly open. But instead of running out of the prison, Paul sees this jailer who's about to kill himself because he knows he will be held accountable for those prisoners leaving. And he goes to take his own law, life. And Paul says, don't do it. We're all here. And he leads him to Jesus, takes him to their house. His whole family becomes Christ followers, and they all get baptized. And so now in this church, you got Lydia, ex-demon girl, and Jailer Joe just hanging out in the same church. I just think it's cool. But that was a hard experience for Paul. In that moment, he realized what could happen if he continues on. But guess what he did? 
He kept going because that's what leaders do. So that brings us to Acts 17. Y'all with me? Because see, I want, I'm going to pull some, some leadership lessons out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But before that, I, you, you got to know, you got to understand the context in which this letter that Paul wrote to this church, like the context around why it was written and when it was written and how it came about. Y'all with me? Does this, this is that Bible nerdy stuff that's important because the Bible's connected, y'all. Acts chapter 17. This is just on the heels of getting out of jail at, at, at Philippi. Paul now is moving on, and he's leaving this church behind to grow and thrive, and he moves on to his next assignment. It says this in Acts 17, verse 1. After they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went to the synagogue on three Sabbath days days, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. Hmm. Verse 5. But the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Attacking Jason's house, they searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason out and some, dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down. Let's be the one that turns the world upside down. Come on. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The crowd and city officials who heard these things were upset. After taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Now, I I wanted you just to see kind of the, the birthing of the church at Thessalonica. Because as you walk through the book of Acts, God gives us this really cool thing. He shows us these churches that Paul's leadership and influence are are able to help kind of birth and and bring up from the ground. And then later on in the New Testament, we get letters that Paul writes to these churches. Like Philippi. When you read Philippians, every time I read Philippians, I think about the moment that that does the letter come to to Lydia's house and they're in Lydia's house and and who's reading this letter to and there's Jailer Joe and his family just hanging out learning about Jesus. Well, Thessica, th- it's funny, Thessalonica is a city that Paul, did you notice it said he preached for three Sabbath days? So the best way we can tell best we can tell, he only spent three weeks in this town. Three weeks, but they got two letters. Number one, the fact that Paul was only there for three weeks, but years later, he sends a letter to them because that church is still thriving and flourishing and doing amazing things for the kingdom of God. It's a reminder. Paul left, but the movement stayed because the movement was always about Jesus and never about Paul. The church should never be dependent on one man or one group of people to be healthy and thriving. The church is a collective of the body of Christ, all of us bearing the responsibility of making sure what God wants to do in this community happens. And if tomorrow I got hit by a bus or taken home to be with the Lord or whatever it might be, I pray that this church has enough people in it that will say, we will keep moving forward for God's glory because there's still work to be done. Now listen, I ain't planning on going nowhere. Someday I'm going to hand this church over to Mason Hockett, and you're going to see me saying, welcome to Walmart. (laughs) I've retired. It's not about one person. It's not about two people or three people. That the mission of the church is the collective ownership of everybody that's a part of the body. That's why your influence and your leadership, that's why it matters. That's why it matters. Do you know how many people are sitting around you today? It ain't got nothing to do with me. It's the influence of somebody else sitting around you that shared the gospel with them, told them about Jesus, 
and what God was doing in this place and thought maybe, maybe they could benefit from being here as well. That's how this church has grown. But after Paul leaves, there are some people that try to destroy what God's doing. Because listen, there's nothing the enemy hates more than a thriving body of believers. Because it is a threat to his agenda in the world. See, the the body of Christ is there to lift up the purposes of God, and it counteracts the purposes of Satan. Come on. And so the reason why Paul writes his first letter to Thessalonica is to help respond to some of the things that people are trying to do to bring down this movement. Because the, the church is still flourishing. Paul continues to get word of all the amazing things that God is doing in and through this body. But he also gets word that there's this plot to try to destroy what God is doing there. And it's interesting what happens. And this seems to be a pattern all throughout history. That if you cannot dismiss what God is doing, you try to discredit who God is doing it through. That if you cannot dismiss what God is doing, you try to discredit what God, who God is doing it through. And I think an even more dangerous pattern is when God is doing something, the enemy attacks the, the leadership in ways because if you can get the leaders to fall, maybe you can get the whole thing to crumble. And how many times have we watched that happen? Which is why this conversation is important because I'm sick of it. And so Paul is writing in response to what he's hearing being said about him. And what he says in chapter 2, God just kind of hit me with some convicting things that reveal who he was as a leader. And listen to me, look at me, and who I want to be as a leader. And who I think we all need to be as leaders in this movement entrusted to us by God. So let's look at it. Y'all with me say amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to start with verse 1. Paul says, For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit with you was not without result. On the contrary, after we had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. I'm just going to give it to you the way I've been writing in my journal as I've been reading these verses. Is that okay? If you're going to be an inspirational leader, you have to learn to respond to painful opposition with faithful obedience. You have to learn to respond to painful opposition with faithful obedience. With all that Paul had experienced in Philippi, I would say it's a miracle that he even ended up in Thessalonica. At every turn, what God does in one place is amazing, but the things that he has to endure as that happens has to kind of make him pause for a minute about going on to the next place. He had just been beaten and thrown in prison. And I would just submit to you, we know a lot of people, we know a lot of leaders that would say, okay, I'm done. That so often when we experience opposition, we let it put us in, we let, us, we let it put us on the sidelines and we never get back in the game. Listen to me. If you're going to pursue leveraging your influence for the glory of God, it is inevitable that painful opposition will come. You start to leverage your influence, discipling your kids to know Jesus, painful opposition will come. You start to intentionally have conversations in your home, in your office, in what, uh, pain, and I intentionally use those words, not just opposition, painful opposition, not just difficulty, things that hurt. It may not be the physical pain that Paul had to endure to keep the gospel moving. It may, it may be relational pain, emotional pain. You cannot walk out a calling for God and it not have consequences and cost. And when it does, you have a choice. Will you cower in fear or will you boldly keep moving forward in faith knowing that your God is with you and for you as long as you're giving him glory? Paul had 
reason to fear and reason to remain in Philippi and never go to Thessalonica or just to hide away and think, you know what, I've done enough, I've done some good, I've planted some churches, all is good. But God was saying, nope, you need to go here. And he could have sat in his fear, but instead he got bold and walked forward. Never let persecution push you off purpose. Verse 3. He continues. Now listen, for, for our exhortation did not come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. For we never used flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives. God is our witness, and we didn't seek glory from people, either from you or from others. See, this narrative was being pushed about Paul that he's just in it for himself. It's just about him. It's just about his glory. It's just about his fame. And Paul says, now you know that when we came, that it wasn't about that, that we didn't come to tickle people's ears, that we were not there for approval or popularity. We were there for God's glory, and you got to pick one. This is the way I wrote it in my notes, that if I'm going to be an inspirational leader, I must be more concerned with honoring God than pleasing people. That the moment that you get this backwards, things begin to go sideways. And most often issues happen in the church and in faith communities when it becomes more about pleasing people than honoring God. And see, we think when I say that, you're just thinking about like compromising and not being offensive or not speaking truth in a way that the world may get mad. Now I'm talking about we start as, as leaders at times trying to keep certain people happy because they give the most money or they do this and that kind of stuff. No, it will always be about what brings God honor and glory no matter who gets offended or frustrated or hurt about it. Our intent is never to be offensive, but the result might be when we speak truth. Did you hear me? Our intent is never to be offensive, but the truth might be as a result. He says, you know what? You know how we were there. We didn't didn't, didn't try to use flattering speech. We weren't trying to, we just spoke the word. I often think as a pastor, I will trade anointing over eloquence anytime. Because the most eloquent words, absent of the anointing of God, will do nothing significant in the eyes of eternity. We can't be driven by approval or popularity. If you're going to be a leader, sometimes that means you're not going to be popular. Look at me. If you're going to be a leader, you're going to get criticized. I love that old quote, to avoid all criticism, do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. We must be more concerned with honoring God than pleasing people. Let's keep going. Verse 7. Paul says, although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles. Instead, we were gentle among you as a nurse nurtures her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. Paul knew that leadership involved more of caring for people than controlling people. Here's the way I wrote it in my notes. If I'm going to be an inspirational leader, instead of operating with control, you have to serve with compassion. When you lead and you leverage influence, you understand the importance of that influence and you want to protect that influence in somebody's life. The leadership in the New Testament It was personal. It wasn't positional. That it was earned. It wasn't expected. That Paul's influence was earned as he didn't just stand high on a platform and speak down to people. He didn't speak from above people. He spoke among the people. He said, we didn't just share the gospel. We shared our own lives present among you, with you. Understanding that people aren't projects, they're people. You know, the church can be really bad about loving, th- or 
loving things and using people. Instead of loving people and using things. Paul evidently lived among them in a way where they really felt like co-laborers in this thing together. See, we're all leaders. Some of us just have different spaces and places that we do that, maybe even different levels of authority in certain places. But authority is never something to be abused. It's something to steward well with grace. That's We've all seen people abuse the power and the authority and the position of leadership they've been given. I don't take lightly and I hold it with an open hand the position God has allowed me to have in this place. Let's keep reading. Now let me give you, I want to give you John Stott because I wrote, I read a really cool quote that aligns with this whole thing. It's by John Stott, great preacher, great author. He said this, the authority by which the Christian leader leads is not by power but love. Not force but example. Not coercion but reasoned persuasion. Leaders have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to serve. A mentor told me one time, and I've said it hundreds of times on this platform, if you're not willing to serve, you will never be qualified to lead. Which leads us to verse 9. He says, for you remember our labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preach God's gospel to you. That apparently while, while Paul was there and what had become precedent is, is they, would, they would support the apostles when they would come. But Paul says, no, when we came in, we weren't, we weren't unwilling to get in there with you to serve and to serve alongside you, to be with you down in the grit of ministry. I wrote this in my notes. Never expect from others more than you demand of yourself. A good leader will never expect from others more than they demand of themselves. It boggles my mind and frustrates me, this hierarchy of importance we've placed in the church. As if the most important place you could ever serve is up here and not out there. Man, you wouldn't believe the leaders that are out in that parking lot at 6.30 every Sunday morning picking up the God knows what out of that parking lot. Serving. And if we ever see that as less important than this, then we've misunderstood that all of it is a collective thing for God's glory and the benefit of his kingdom. Never expect from others more than you demand of yourself. Y'all still with me? I just got a couple more and we're done. Verse 10. Paul says, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly righteously and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. I don't know if you've noticed it, but at some point I invite you to go back and read this passage again and circle the number in the times Paul says, you know, you witnessed, you saw that the greatest defense Paul had for the things and the lies that were being said about them is the experience of the people he was writing to because they knew him. He was not a stranger. It's hard to defend someone you don't know. It's easy to go to bat for somebody that was in the foxhole with you the whole time. That Paul was among them, with them, serving them. This is what I wrote in my notes. Those who know you best should respect you most. It's a big church, and I don't get to know everybody. And I try to know as many as I can, navigate all that. But I wanna, I wanna be the guy that when questions or rumors or things get said about me, if somebody goes to those who know me best, I don't have to wonder 
how I will be perceived by them because I've lived in a way among them that they can say about me what they said about Paul. He was righteous and he was blameless and he was pure and his motives were right. But, and they don't have to guess. They know because we were in it together. That's why I will always choose my family over y'all. Because the ones who know me most are the three people that live in the walls of my house, my wife and my two children. I care way more what they think about me than any of y'all. Because <laughs> I deeply believe before I will ever have to give an account of who I was as a pastor, I'll have to give an account of who I was as a husband and a father. But our staff and all those people that I've had a chance to build a relationship with who've seen me at my worst, who have walked me through painful experiences, if you don't know me and you ask one of them, I don't want them to ever be in position where they got a lie to you for me. Because they know who I am and they've watched me in those spaces. Paul says, all this stuff you're hearing laid against what you experienced and see if it adds up. And he's saying, you know it doesn't. You know it doesn't. Verse 11, he says, as you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each of you to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own glory. You see, I think all of us need to take ownership of these things. I don't think it's just something that I or our team need to represent. I think you need to be able to respond to painful opposition with faithful obedience. I think we all should be more concerned with honoring God than pleasing people. I think we should all be operating more with compassion than we are control. I don't think any of us should expect from others what we don't demand of ourselves. I think all of us would say we want those who know us best to respect us most. This church exists to inspire people to live and love like Jesus. That means leading like Jesus. And I don't know if you know this, but as I poured over these, I think Jesus embodied every single one of these things. In spite of painful opposition, he still walked in faithful obedience to that cross to die for our sins and experience that agony. He never let what the Pharisees said or what people thought about him keep him from saying the truthful things he had heard from the Father. He operated not with control of his disciples, but as one so compassionate, looking them in the eyes and walking with them through the everyday things of life. I think it's very clear that he never expected anything from anybody that he wasn't willing to do. He laid down his own life. And the ones that knew him best were the ones that carried his mission forward. They were so inspired with how he led. Let's be that. Let's be that. Do you remember what they said? They said, these guys are turning the world upside down. Let's be the one that turns the world upside down. This upside down kingdom that God came to establish through his people that's now been entrusted to us to carry forward for generations to head. Let's be who we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do and make Jesus known. Let's be a light, not under a bowl, but bright, shining to a world that's dark and broken and hurting. And the only thing that will solve it is Jesus. And it's our job to take him to the world. You bow your heads, close your eyes with me. But can I ask you to do some self-examination the way these verses kind of pressed me to do? Of all the things that Paul speaks about being present in him, what's absent in you? What needs to change? What needs to be different? We're going to worship and we're going to pray and the altar is going to be open. And can I invite you just to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit, however it might be? Father, I pray that as we worship you, as we lift up your name, that you would investigate our hearts. God, as David wrote, search me and know me, God. And if there's anything in me, anything in me standing in the way 
of being who you've called me to be as a vessel of your glory, as an instrument of your grace, as a declarer of your gospel. Purify us, God. You have entrusted us in this time, in this place, to make your son known to the world. May we have boldness, may we have courage, may we have character, may we have all the things necessary that we might be the city on the hill. That we might be accurately, consistently lifting you up. That all men might be drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray.